So we are ready to begin our third talk of the day. Our third speaker is uh, Siddharth Gadgir. He is a mathematician at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He did his undergraduate at the Indian uh, Statistical Institute at Kolkata and then went on to do his uh, PhD uh, at, uh, at Caltech. And then he spent a uh, postdoctoral stint at Stony Brook. He spent some time as a faculty member at uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, uh, at, at Indian Statistical Institute, Bangalore. And now he's at the Indian uh, Institute of Science. He started off his research career uh, working in topology. Uh, he's worked in many areas, many related areas, and he's also worked on applying topology to study things like molecular biology. But in recent years, he's been focusing on uh, automated theorem proving, on automating mathematics. And today he's going to share with us his thoughts on where the large scale digitization of mathematics and the advances in AI, what do they have to say for the future of mathematics and maybe for our future of mankind? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this uh, wonderful uh, venue on the quest for automating mathematics. So, like, so, yeah. so I'll, I'll be giving a quick survey of a really rapidly moving area these days. So one of the things that from for a long time in history was considered a great challenge for automation was chess. And this was conquered in 1997 when Deep Blue, a uh, system made by IBM, defeated Gary Kasparov. But that turned out to be in some sense a false dawn. I mean, it was not actually important. The methods that went into that did not go far beyond chess, not even to a related game like Go. But in 2017, you had a true milestone when a system called AlphaGo defeated uh, Lee Sedol, an 18-time world champion at this Chinese game called Go. We'll see why that was so important later. Well, down there in comparison is Terence Tao, maybe today's world's top mathematician. Uh, well, what system will get there, whether it will get there, when, and most importantly, how? Nothing is going to happen by magic. I mean, it's we who have to make it happen. I mean, we meaning we all collectively as mankind, if it's to happen at all. So this is what I will take a quick survey of. Uh, so there is, of course, no world champion for mathematics. The symmetry was there. It's a collective endeavor, as is the quest to automate mathematics. And indeed, most of the progress has happened accidentally. People are working towards other goals, and uh, progress they make helps in automating mathematics. And conversely, when we say our goal is automating mathematics, actually what we hope for is many other byproducts, especially helping mathematicians, students of mathematics, and users of mathematics with tools, with automation, and so on, and also making trains safer. You'll see where trains come in in a little while. So let me begin with a quick prelude. We look at mathematical reasoning a little more closely. Uh, because I have to talk in the concrete, I want a couple of examples of mathematical proofs. These are proofs at high school level. Uh, so they're not sophisticated ones, but still, uh, it's the most mathematical part of this talk. Some of three angles of a triangle was mentioned earlier today in curvature in the context of triangles. We know it's 180 degrees. Why is this so? Well, here's a proof. Consider a triangle ABC, this picture is on Wikipedia, and we draw a line through A parallel to BC. So once you have drawn this line, you can use equality of opposite interior angles to see those two blue angles are equal, those two red angles are equal, and then use the fact that angles on a line add up to 180 degrees, hence the angles come to these. There is one aspect of this proof which I will emphasize later. Here is a second result, again going back to antiquity. There are infinitely many primes. Both these are usually attributed to Euclid. Uh, for any n, so a way of formulating it is for any n, there is a prime such that the prime is bigger than n. So there's a prime bigger than a billion, there's a prime bigger than a trillion. Well, how do we know this? We'll consider the number n factorial plus 1. n factorial means 1 into 2 into a, so on into n. Uh, add 1 to that. And every number has a prime factor. Let's take the smallest prime factor of n factor of n factorial plus 1. Now, this cannot be less than n because if it is less than or equal to n, it is one of those numbers 1 to n. So, p does not divide n factorial plus 1 because if it divides, if it is less than or equal to n, it divides n factorial and you cannot divide consecutive numbers if, as long as you are bigger than 1. Okay? So, that number we constructed is a prime greater than 1. Now, I have kept these as examples to try to understand what went into the proof. 
And the first key point were in auxiliary construction. Why did we consider that parallel line? Why not drop a perpendicular? Why not take a circle or a inscribing the circumscribing the triangle or a circle inside the triangle or have an amoeba come and eat the triangle? I mean, there, there are many things you could do. We chose to draw that parallel line. This is even more drastic here. I mean, why n factorial plus 1? Why not 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n? Why not 1 squared plus 2 squared? Why not n to the n? I mean, so some, some, somewhere these auxiliary constructions came. Then we had the theorems or definitions we used. That is, we used those opposite interior angles are equal. We also used the fact that every number has a prime factor. And then we did some deductions and computations. These proofs had no computations. A real one has quite a few usually. And quite uh, deductions were also few in number. Okay. Also another key point here is that the theorems we need to know in two senses. We need to know the precise statements because we are going to use them for deduction. And we are also going to be need to know which theorem is useful where. So we need to have be able to recognize relevance. And these are different ways of uh, understanding theorems. It's, it's important for students of mathematics to realize they are different from each other. Knowing precise statements and knowing relevance, you should know both. So this is to put it in a framework uh, following two systems for thinking. The words I use are those of Kahneman. Uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, but many, many people say it this way uh, even before. So our thinking is basically based on two systems. The first is an intuitive system, which Kahneman calls system one. So intuitive, associative, automatic. So this is what handles sensory motor tasks, but also language. Uh, it's fast, but it's error prone. Okay. Uh, we'll see this relevant to for common experience these days. Uh, and the system two is our analytical logical control system. This handles reasoning, planning, problem solving in the human sense, not mathematical sense needs both. It's slow, but it's finally accurate. Okay. But we'll make a slight diversion. Uh, a common misconception is uh, what is the Moravec paradox, okay. is that actually system one needs far more raw computational power than system two. Even though system two, uh, Kahneman says is for difficult problems and system one for simple problems and humans tend to think this way. Our sensory motor system actually needs much more computational power than multiplying numbers. Okay? And our brain which is mostly system one to get numbers is performs about 100 trillion operations per second. It's about 100 teraflops. Okay? So this uh, laptop is just on the gigaflop scale. So again, to understand how computers and humans uh, relate when we are automating things. So Moravec predicted, Hans Moravec is a robotist. He analyzed these sensory motor systems and so on and predicted in 1997 by extrapolation that computers will reach parity with humans in 2040. He said that's when we'll manage to be successful at robotics. But there is one more dimension to keep in mind. I'll make a, for this digression onto hardware. Our brain storage is about 100 terabytes. And this can be viewed as sort of memory, but another way of viewing this is as accumulated knowledge. That our memory, experience, learning, etc., is stored in 100 trillion numbers. We'll just call them weights, 100 trillion weights. This is our experience. Okay. The reason I'm making this diversion is we want to compare, com when we want to automate things, we have to compare both hardware and ideas. Well, you wonder if we have so much hardware, why aren't we supercomputers? Well, the thing is that our neuron is not fast. It computes only 1 to 200 at most operations per second. Our brain is quite slow. It is just that it does 100 trillion operations because there are a huge number of neurons working in parallel. But not everything can be done in parallel. For example, if you are doing your uh, long division, you have to write down the number and then subtract and then bring down another number from above. You can't do all of these at once. So suppose you have to do step by step. A billion steps are done instantly in this laptop, but we will just take forever. But if you have to do a trillion steps all at the same time, you could do them in your brain. A twist to this tale is that if you compare computers today with 15 years ago, Actually, they have stopped getting faster. So brain computers are faster than humans. Instead, they're getting more and more parallel. 
So computers are changing by becoming more like our brain. I mean, so there are different positions, but the growth in computers has started moving them towards our brain, especially with what I call graphics processing units. So my final slide on this hardware digression, let's just actually look at some numbers. NVIDIA A100 GPU, I think this is slightly one generation behind, delivers 312 teraflops of performance. So it's reached Moravec's number already. Okay. And well, okay, Saturn rockets went to the moon. How common are these? You could rent this on a Google Cloud. It costs less than hiring a mathematician in India, much less than hiring a mathematician in a developed country. Okay. So you can get a mathematician's brain in this measure for less than a mathematician. On the other hand, RAM on a GPU is only 40 gigabytes. Remember, there was the 100 terabytes for the brain. We can scale this up by having lots of GPUs. So maybe the better measure is to look at accumulated knowledge. The largest AI system is what is called PARM. Uh, GPT is more famous because AI is, uh, sorry, open AI is more fond of publicity. But the largest system is Google's PARM. It's 540 billion weights. Remember, that's much less than 100 trillion. So by one measure, we have reached the brain. By another, uh, we are far behind it. Of course, most of the knowledge of the human brain is not relevant for mathematics. But it's also true of most of the knowledge of palm. So uh, how the ratios are, we don't know. OK, so that was the measure of hardware. Uh, before I leave it, let me just say the reason I've said this is that we tend to focus too much on ideas. If you have all the right ideas but no hardware, uh, it will be no use. Okay? So some of the ideas come from much before the hardware was there to use them. On the other hand, if you do things the wrong way, no hardware will save you, but uh, still. So what were the ingredients for doing mathematics? We have an accumulation of knowledge. And as I said, you need two kinds, associations and precise. This is logical and intuitive. We learn to learn. We do computations and deductions, which are logical. Recognition of relevance, this is our intuition. And analogy based constructions, these are crucial. These are intuition. This is what some years ago you would say computers really can't do. And being original, going beyond what we already know. This can come from anywhere. It can come from intuition, logic, a combination of the two. So this was a sort of summary before we go ahead to try to understand what the progress has been in what computers do. Understand in just a quick survey. But because this is all uh, kind of abstract, I want to put a solid numbers on it. Here's an open bet on Twitter made by, suggested by, uh, offered, I should say, by Christian Zegedi, uh, who's the head of the maths in Google research. He offered this bet by the year 2029. He said a diverse set of 100 graduate texts are automatically formalized, means translated into a language understandable by the computer and full details filled in and checked. And 10% of 100 pre-selected open problems are proved completely autonomously. Okay, so we should put some meat. And this is just a bet by Zegedi. I'm not saying this is empirical reality. But I want to put some concrete numbers on it. Okay. okay, so let me kind of start the survey of what computer proofs actually have done. And what we have, what has been accomplished, I would say, are four peaks. The big peak, of course, is not there yet, which is actually automating mathematics. But these four peaks suggest four capabilities, which are what are needed. Putting them together is, of course, a different matter, which we'll come to. So the first peak are computer proofs in the small in mathematics. I'll say what it is. So first famous case of computer assisted proof was the four color problem by Apple and Haken in 1980 or so. Uh, any map can be colored with at most four colors. Um, more recently, about 2000, there was the Kepler conjecture. The most efficient way to pack spheres is the hexagonal close packing. Humans know this intuitively. This is routinely used. Kep this is the same Johannes Kepler of Kepler's laws of motion. So you can imagine how long it was an open problem before it was solved. Yeah, so Kepler made it. Uh, Smale conjecture, this was David Gabay proved this uh, with computer assistance. The computer work was not his. Uh, this is my thesis advisor. That's why I'm mentioning it. Now, all these are essentially enumerative, meaning a huge number of similar calculations. The fi first one was just actual finite calculations. Kepler conjecture were linear programming problems, lots and lots of them. 
Smale conjecture used compact enumeration, which is one level more, but there is still one kind of calculation. And most problems do not fall into these. These are very useful. They work in some cases. A more important case was the Robbins conjecture, as it was called. So, this was a conjectural characterization of Boolean algebras. You can ignore what the statement is, but Boolean algebras are basically capturing true and false and the logic involved in true and false. So, they are basic in computer science. So, Huntington had given one characterization and Robbins conjectured a nicer one. Uh, it was considered important, that is all that mattered. People like Tarski worked on it or at least Tarski students and so on. And this was conjectured in 1930s and finally it was proved in 1996 using the automated uh, theorem prover EQP. So, I am forgetting the name of the person who proved it, McCune I think. Uh, now, this was actually a non-trivial proof by deduction. So, and somebody has printed it out in LaTeX, translated it, you can read it. It would be a highly virtuosic human proof. A human could have come up with this. There are humans who are capable of proving like that. It is extremely high skilled uh, human proof. It is a few pages long. It is not horrible. But it remained open for a very, very long time and was solved. Now, this was a deductive proof, a real mathematical proof. It was in the small only in the sense we knew we started with a small domain of mathematics. This set of axioms. It did not involve pulling a theorem from here and there. Another one along this line is a very attractive statement. Can you color the positive integers with two colors, red and blue, so that if you take a triple like 3, 4, 5 or 12, 13, 17, which are three sides of a right angle triangle, they are not all the same color. So, 3, 4, 5 cannot be the same color. Okay, so, this was asked by in the 1980s by a well-known mathematician Ron Graham. He offered a hundred dollar prize. Of course, this was a curiosity. So, very intriguing kind of question. It was solved in 2016, uh, I have written the authors there, using what is called a SAT solver. This is a powerful deduction engine for finite problems. Okay. They showed that this is not the case. It is up to some 7, 8, 4, 5 or something you can and 7, 8, 4, 6 you cannot. I am guessing the numbers approximately. You may think it is finite, but brute force is impossible here. You have to, you do split into cases a lot. But the numbers are simply too big to do it by brute force. It has to be really smart reason. So, these were examples which show that when it is, it is a deduction from a finite set within a domain of mathematics, computers have gone, surpassed humans uh, and by quite a margin actually. But what about handling mathematics in the large? Okay, here we use interactive theorem provers. So, these are software systems where proofs are obtained by human machine collaboration. And what the computer does is both finds parts of proofs and verifies correctness. So, what you can do is digitize mathematics on a large scale and this becomes very structured, modular, unlike human written text. And there is a lot of automation which helps you in this formalization. At the extreme case, if the automation did everything, you have automated the mathematics. It does not yet. Okay. So, the lean mathematical library, this is one of the big uh, progress recently, it has the lean theorem prover is a system which has become the leading one for people in mathematics. It has most undergraduate mathematics and some uh, advanced topics already in digitized, formalized in it. Okay. Now, the nice thing is that you have a wonderful virtuous cycle. As more mathematics is in such libraries, libraries, it becomes both easier and more enjoyable to formalize it. Easier because you are proving things in terms of existing theorems that are already there and more enjoyable because you are not having to formalize baby stuff. You are formalizing maybe fairly advanced stuff that you are working on. And also automation is improving. So, more and more formalization is done by the machine. Now, Lean 4, which is still in progress really, but been around for a year, is a programming language which is seamlessly integrated with the interactive theorem prover. This both helps formalization and makes formalization useful in other ways, which we will see in a few minutes. But the current main application of Lean is to ensure a superhuman level of correctness. Now, mathematical literature has mistakes. It has papers published in the top journals, annals of maths, which are wrong and unfixably wrong. I won't go into details of these things, uh, but the error rate is modest. Of course, we would like to push up the uh, correctness rate, bring down the error rate to superhuman level of correctness, but we want to do it without superhuman effort. 
So the hope is that interactive theorem provers are good enough for that. Yeah. Well, there is a subtle question, why should I trust lean? So computer verified proof is only as trustworthy as a system that verifies the proof. This was addressed as far back as 1968 by De Bruyne who created Automat, one of the first such systems. So the idea is that the lean theorem prover I am taking as an example is a very large piece of software, fantastic amount of engineering, but the part that checks the proof is very small. The rest of it is to help find the proof. So as long as the trusted kernel which is the part that checks the proof is correct, then your proof is correct. You do not have to worry about, even if something finds a wrong proof, the kernel will reject it. Okay. Even better, this is the world of open source, lean theorem prover has four proof checkers written in four languages. The first was actually lean's kernel itself just separated out, here it is just check this part. But then people wrote in, th first in Haskell, then in Scala uh, and now in Rust. Uh, language which uh, uh, theorem prover which uh, mm, independently can check a trusted kernel the proofs written by lean. You can also tell which language computer scientists respect by seeing which uh, proofs were written, which languages were used for these proof check checkers. So, but in a specific case one still has a failure point, you have to check that the definition and statement are correct. Someone will tell you, so here is my formal proof that uh, Riemann hypothesis is true. Actually, they proved 1 plus 1 equals 2. Uh, but it is actually much easier to check the statements than the proofs. And especially because the statements use, uh, will use mostly standard definitions. Okay. So here is one major milestone in this business of using automation, not to discover, but to check proof. This was called a liquid tensor experiment. Peter Scholzer, who is a fields medalist, he challenged the formalization community to computer verify a foundational theorem of what he called condensed mathematics being developed by Clausen and Scholzer. Okay. Uh, so I am he this is from the blog post. With this theorem, the hope the condensed formalism can be fruitfully applied to real functional analysis stands or falls. I think the theorem is of utmost foundational importance, so being 99.9% .9 sure is not enough. He said for months he was worried there would be a small gap, no human has checked it thoroughly and people will build on it and it will turn out that uh, the proof was wrong. It is a very amusing post, he also says that he has a track record of being extremely convincing. For example, two completely wrong proofs of his were widely believed to be correct. So he is extra worried that the same could have happened here. So this was taken up by the lean community, Johan Komala uh, led this, is a, then a postdoc and Adam Topas I should actually give credit there also. With active collaboration from Scholzer himself and in about 6 months a major step which was called theorem 9.4 of Scholzer's note was proved. Scholzer at that point said this was the part he was worried about, so he was now satisfied correctness was done. So in a sense it was a success but in every sense it is a success now. About a year later the original stated theorem was proved in lean, fully corrected. Okay. So, Scholzer also commented that he understood aspects of his proof after the formalization which he had not earlier. So, while this was a massive community effort, it took a lot of work, showed that what top mathematicians consider important for future mathematics is getting assistance in this way. Couple of other such examples, this is more amusing. Thomas Bloom proved a very nice result, he was a postdoc then at Oxford or Cambridge, I forget which. He said that if you take any large enough set of natural numbers, you can tune out of details of the statement, set of positive upper density, you can find some subset whose sum of the reciprocals add up to 1. Okay. Does not matter what uh, uh, the details of the statement if you do not understand, it was a long standing question of Erdash and Graham, a very nice paper duly submitted presumably to the Annals of Maths for publication. And while the paper was under review, Thomas Bloom learnt lean. He collaborated with Bhavik Mehta who was an expert both in lean and the same area of mathematics and formalized it in lean. So an important result was checked by a computer before it was checked by humans here. Yeah, another uh, uh, real time formalization example, this is a beautiful theorem Giles Gardam proved uh, what is called a Kaplansky's unit conjecture. Okay. Again long standing conjecture, uh, group rings of torsion free uh, groups do not have non trivial units. If you do not know the mathematics, ignore it. 
Interestingly, he used a SAC solver to find the non-trivial unit. So his proof involved computer assistance. Okay, and about a year later, Anand Rao Tadipatri is a Iser Pune undergraduate. Yeah, he and I collaborated and formalized this in Lean 4. Uh, and here we use the fact that it's a programming language as well as a theorem prover. And while it while it was a year later, the actual formalization took us only a couple of weeks. It was it was a very short paper, but uh, so but it really is real time that you can do this. So what these examples show is the effort for formalization is rapidly decreasing. Maybe without superhuman effort, we'll get the benefits. Now the mathematics in Lean is much better structured. It also has powerful automation. So what this hopes is pays way for facilitating mathematical discovery. So this is what I call the second peak where we are handling mathematics in the large, but not yet autonomously, still interactively. A brief digression, formal methods. These are where we specify software, hardware, networking protocols in the mathematical terms. Someone even did this with a French tax code for whatever reason. Uh, and then you give mathematical proofs of correct behavior, which you verify, computer verified. And this gives a much greater degree of certainty than any form of testing that you would want. But proofs are much harder than tests, okay, enormously harder than tests. So these are done with interactive theorem provers, and with better theorem provers, we can prove more often. So the point of formal methods is, are they worth it? Well, they're worth it if we really need to be completely correct always. And when do we do? One, this is a known case, the Pentium bug from the 1990s was very expensive for Intel. They had to recall an entire line of uh, soft, uh, chips. It's not like a software where we keep getting patches in our operating system every night or uh, frequently enough. You can't patch hardware easily. Second, the most obvious case, if uh, things are life uh, and death matters, this is an unfortunately uh, infamous case, Therac 25 radiation machine. There was a software bug, so uh, patients got a hundred times too high a dose of uh, x-rays while well, being treated. Of course, many patients died as a result. And the third case, maybe less obvious, but is also very important, systems level software. You don't have heard of the WhatsApp Pegasus attack. It was a small mistake in an obscure corner of WhatsApp software that nobody would have ever encountered most likely in the history of WhatsApp, except that hackers go looking for these. They probe here, there, take what seems like a highly unlikely scenario will make it happen. And indeed, here are users of uh, formal chips. Intel uses them. The Paris driverless metro is, uh, uses formal methods. They use proofs. Uh, system software use it. Incidentally, a group in Bangalore working with Alstom, the same company, is also using formal methods. Their manufacturing is not far from Chennai in Sri City. Okay, so now I move towards the next two milestones, the most famous now. So the first two were system two kind of things. They were based on rules, but uh, towards artificial intelligence. The other two come from AI. So I partly formulate this as barriers to overcome. The old style AI, was to overcome the fact that we have common sense, so computers don't, so we can't do things. So Marvin Minsky's view, it's not important, so let's just accept it, was that common sense is just that we know a lot of things in a nicely structured way that they can be combined. So expert systems, they have a lot of knowledge, lots of rules encoded, and then lots of clever algorithms. And so they're purely logical system to systems. They also need brute raw power. They need fast algorithms, lots of knowledge gathered together. And indeed, Deep Blue was such a system. Okay, so in 1997, computer Deep Blue defeated Kasi Kasparov. It was an expert system. It was based on elaborate rules for judging whether white is stronger or black is stronger at any given position. Okay. We are, anyone who knows chess learns about the relative value of different pieces. Then you learn a little more. But these have lots and lots of chess theory in them. But still, Deep Blue was very limited in certain capabilities. For example, if you just showed Kasparov or any top chess player, or chess board, they would be able to tell whether white or black was stronger, uh, much better than a system like Deep Blue. 
But what Deep Blue compensated for this was by brute force of considering far more sequences. Now, this does not work elsewhere. So, this is what would be called a tacit knowledge barrier. So, tacit knowledge is the kind of knowledge that you cannot transfer to another person by means of writing it down or verbalizing it. For example, riding a bicycle, you, when you teach someone to ride a bicycle, you hold the back of their bicycle and run along and let them go. But you do not teach them how to pedal, I mean you give them some rough idea, they have to learn it themselves. Swimming, speaking a language, also evaluating positions in chess, it involved a lot of tacit knowledge. It is in fact much more important in Go compared to chess, partly because Go all coins look the same. So, you cannot just say this person has a queen and that person has a bishop or whatever else uh, and relative position mattered. So, it turned out to be much more important and also in the Chinese game Go number of legal moves is much larger. So, brute force is less effective. So, as a result deep blue style expert systems are hopeless at Go. At the time when deep blue bit Kasparov my uh, fellow student Hao Li, who is a very successful mathematician, so he is a very intelligent person clearly, said he could comfortably beat the best Go system by giving it a large handicap. He's a, he was a good amateur Go player, but he is a mathematician as I said, not a Go player at all. Well, what got past tacit knowledge was deep learning. I mean, computers can acquire knowledge by learning and the idea of computers learning goes back at least to Turing. So, Turing tests the, if you read the original paper which I recommend, it is a charmingly written paper and he says that instead of trying to teach a computer uh, how to talk, maybe you should teach it like a child to learn to talk, I mean program it like a child to learn to talk. So, but of course, regression can be said to be learning, that is even before Turing was born. What was needed was hardware and also a system that could learn efficiently and these were what are called deep neural networks. Briefly, you have an input, it becomes an output through a series of layers, I will show a picture in a moment and this is typically what is called a linear transformation depending on weights followed by simple nonlinear function. So, I will keep making some such comments which you should tune out if, uh, if you do not follow, uh, sorry about that, but for those who do follow I think they are important to make. Okay, so, that was a picture of this, here is an input. It goes through this whole bunch of weights to the next layer, then bunch of weights, next layer. These are called hidden layers. We do not know what happens and an output comes at the end. Starting about 2012, deep neural networks started performing very well in some tasks, particularly image processing tasks. A big landmark was what was called MNIST challenge, which was handwritten digits were being able to recognize handwritten digits. This is where expert systems had stopped improving at some point. And you had a sudden jump with deep learning systems. The ideas incidentally almost all of them were there in the 1980s for this. It was only a hardware improvement in this particular case. An interesting twist here is that it often happens that if you look at the image as it is processed, as you go through successive layers, you get more and more abstraction, more and more meaning is captured. Okay, so, limitations as about 10 years ago just to take a snapshot of where AI went. This needed label data for training, you had to train it to recognize these are ones, these are twos, etc. And somebody had to give it images labeled. It was narrow, it is trained to a specific task. It had difficulty with long range dependencies in particular language. So, it was good at images, AI was good at images, hard to scale up or parallelize. And you could not go beyond training data. None of these limitations continue. One great idea was what is called representation learning. It is quite interesting in the paper that introduced it, they just said maybe this will have applications. Within 2-3 years, every paper uses that. It does become standard in a very fast moving field. So, what you did in word to vec you consider the problem of predicting a word in text given its neighbor. Take all of Wikipedia, every set of 5 words, you take 4 neighbors, predict the middle word. So, you will train it on solutions that map these words into space and then you predict neighbors using those. And what resulted is that association got captured by geometry. This is what is called representation learning. So, you learn representations that is you learn geometry to capture associations of words. There is another lesson in this word to vec I do not know if word to vec was literally the first. That is if you do not have data for real problems, just make up problems and do it solve them. 
and that will help you solve real problems as well. In some sense, that's what we do all our lives. I mean, kids learn walking by playing, running around. We solve exercises when we do mathematics. We are all the time learning by solving things which we don't actually want to solve. And this lesson has been eventually imbibed in AI and you get it to do things that you don't actually want it to solve. Okay. So this idea was extended to transfer learning. A common set of layers, a set of common layers is used for many tasks. And some of these could be just for fun. And so this meant that networks resulted in networks trained for one task needing much less training for a related task. Okay, so now the third peak, this was a landmark, very important one, AlphaGo versus Lee Sedol. In March 2016, a Go playing system AlphaGo defeated 18 time world champion Lee Sedol. So in 2010, people were predicting it will take 100 years for this to happen, something like this to happen. But indeed it took much less than that. And Lee said, although he was 18 time world champion, was ranked number 3 at that time. AlphaGo kept getting better. In January 2017, it, uh, it competed against the next world number 1, KG. So it had defeated Lee said, 4-1, it defeated the KG 5-0. Okay. So what was AlphaGo based on? It was based on, like many other systems, a policy, which is what moves should you consider uh, and value, which is how good a position is. So once you have these two, you can do a simple search, which all chess programs have been doing from the very first ones written by Shannon and Turing and so on. That is, if you know what moves to consider, you consider those, think of your opponent considering them and so on and see what happens after a few steps. Okay, I won't go into any details. The important point is that these were trained. So you judged uh, both the policy, what to try and how good your position was by training. Initially policy network was trained by what's called behavior cloning. There was a huge internet database and it tried to predict what will an expert Go player play in this position. Okay, so there were ex expert Go players. So you just try to clone the behavior. Note there are so many positions you will not come to exactly the same position, but you have to predict from that from what data there is. Okay. Then once you have a policy, you keep playing against yourself and see who wins, how often, and that will tell you how often white wins and black wins or whatever are the equivalent. So this is value. Once you have this, you refine your policy by again playing against each other. Okay. So this is called reinforcement learning. You play against yourself again and again and again and learn these things. So an incidental point is that even though AlphaGo had far more hardware than Deep Blue, it considered fewer sequences of moves. Instead, it was using all its computational power for the intuitive tasks of judging value and policy. Okay. And also AlphaGo came up with highly original unexpected moves. What human Go players said were absolutely brilliant and in fact, Lee Sedol was so startled by one of them, he got up and walked around for 10 minutes before he could compose himself and so on. Well, AlphaGo wasn't the last word. It was succeeded and defeated by AlphaGo 0. And this learned purely by self-play. It knew nothing but the rules of Go, started playing against itself, extremely stupid to start with, eventually the best Go player in history. Its successor Alpha 0 could master a variety of games, including the most famous, at least in most of the world, outside East Asia, which is chess. And it took just four hours to become the strongest chess player. Of course, the previous strongest chess player was already a computer program. And it, it continued to train for 24 hours, sorry, 48 hours, discovered most standard chess openings, discarded a few as actually bad, even though they're standard, etc., etc. Its style of playing involved queen sacrifices. It had a dynamic open style and prioritizes peace activity over materials preferring positions that looked risky and aggressive. So this is sort of a bold human style play rather than what you would think of as mechanical playing. Now I am no chess expert, but these, uh, uh, this is Kasparov I am quoting. So you can take these as good descriptions. So that was our third peak reinforcement learning, not in mathematics, but going to superhuman original intelligence in, but again, in a sense, in the small. And this is a paper with a really nice title, I should say, Attention is All You Need. 
and but of course it was a revolutionary paper far beyond its title. So a quick summary, so meaning of a word if we are thinking of a translation problem, it depends on the context that is other words surrounding it. Okay, so there is an architecture called the transformer architecture. Architecture here is how you connect wires in so actually just how you have matrices or something, uh, simulated wires. The transformer architecture, you learn which other words to pay attention, layer after layer. Okay. The goal of this was to allow effective parallelization. It also captured long range dependencies. Okay. One of the more, maybe the most important application today of uh, AI is based on this alpha fold 2. This one predicts uh, proteins folding structures at experimental level. So suddenly the number of proteins whose structures we know has gone from a few thousand to millions I believe. So which was used here. But indeed what happened which is more famous for this is it turned out that with the transformer architecture because you could parallelize things you could train is uh, scale up your training enormously and it was found that as you made the models bigger and bigger with more and more data they just got better and better they didn't saturate okay so then you have these huge models such as gpt3 and palm they have been trained essentially all of the internet and they are trained on these synthetic tasks so either you train them what comes next or fill in the blanks in the, both of these are actually what comes next which has become the more popular style of training Okay. Of course, applications such as DALI, uh, chat GPT have become sensations. So that was the fourth peak in a sense. This is doing things intuitively on the large, okay, but not original. It's putting things together, it's using analogy, it's using things. So where do we stand here? Well, we have highly computer systems, highly capable in intuition and precise reasoning in scalability and originality. Okay, with uh, but different systems doing these things. Yet, of course, these can all individually get much better, and people are working on them. More importantly, we must work them together, make them work together. Indeed, there is a lot of stuff involved in making a lot of work going on to make them work together. In particular, deep learning has been used with uh, the deduction engines quite a lot by Christian Zegedi and Joseph Urban and so on. Well. And we, they help each other not only while doing mathematics, but while learning. And also, not only should they work well together with each other, but work well together with us. Because finally, what we want are tools. We want to do mathematics or we want to use mathematics. And we want ourselves to be able to improve the systems, so they have to interact with us. Okay, so this was the conclusion. I will leave with a last slide, which is a GIF of things happening together. This is a tool translating uh, English as you see there are infinitely many odd numbers into lean theorem prover code. Uh, this is a group of us have done it mainly myself and Anand are the ones who wrote this code. Okay, So with that I will stop. Thanks. Thank you Siddharth for this very nice talk. Uh, we have time for a, maybe just one or two questions. The first is a question uh, sent in by Murli on Twitter. Could you comment on the impact of large language models like Chatbit, ChatGPT in automating proofs? Yes. So, for example, for this tool, so the large, large language models are actually extremely new, and uh, this is really work in progress. Uh, maybe the most substantial one is so there is a system called Minerva de developed by Google Research, and it can solve uh, mathematical problems written in plain text. In uh, and give you a mathematical solution. And it has tolerably good performance. So they tested it out. They tested it out on Poland, um, two different exams, the Poland mathematics exam. It performed better than an average student. Uh, so it's not great, it's not a champion. Uh, they have a bunch of uh, sample questions on their website also. So it does solve some JE mains problems, two of them. Not yet JE advanced problems, so it's, it's at that level. Now the problem here and uh, so also this tool that I showed also uses uh, a language model codex the tool which was translating. So they are used for both solving problems and for auto formalization which is translating uh, to code. The catch is that they tend to be wrong 
You see, the thing with language models is they don't have a good grip on reality. In fact, they have no notion of reality at all, uh, neither in the logical sense nor in the uh, uh, physical sense, empirical sense. So they, they tend to give you wrong stuff and there is a way around it, at least in, in this uh, domain. So what you would try to do is get them to output not informal text because then a human has to check it and what is the point. Uh, but in fact, uh, the same people who made Minerva worked on translation exactly with the idea you have a closed loop, you get them to output things in a formal proof system like Lean which can be checked. Okay. So yes, they have their great uses, they are marvelous systems because they can reason by analogy incredibly well, they know everything, they just tend to be very wrong quite often. So you have to have an independent way of checking whether they are correct or wrong. You are and there are many ways of knowing, uh, making them be correct more often. So this, with this caveats, yes, they are, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Now the next question is, it sounds related, but it really isn't. This is a question by uh, Karthik, posed on Facebook. It's not about LLMs, but about automated proof systems. Yeah. Uh, do you think they can make accidental discoveries the way mathematicians do? Uh, do mathematicians make accidental do discoveries? Do mathematicians make accidental <laughs> discoveries? That's another question. I don't know. I mean, why not? Uh, I don't know what is... Uh, uh, is there I, serendipity in... Uh, well, in they can try things at random, in which case they might make accidental discoveries. It just depends on how you use them. I mean, fundamentally, for example, as I said, Lean is a programming language. So you can program it to do anything. Oh, no, no, I, I should actually mention. Uh, yes, I mean, if you get them to try random things, then they might make accidental discoveries. You can also get them to randomly generate numbers and then try to understand them and it might make uh, such uh, discoveries as well. Yeah. Okay, okay. So Thanks. thank you very much. I'm sure there will be more questions and we can take them in later. So if you have more questions, you can continue to send them in. At the end of the last talk, we will take some more questions for all the speakers.